66. History. Antiquarian or religious? Men have a variety of motivations for their actions, some trivial and some important. Thus, some men do not steal out of fear of the police or in fear of their wives. The reasons can be pragmatic, but they can also be moral. A bumper sticker I saw today read, Don't steal. The government hates competition. Motivations and reasons as they govern human action presuppose a realm of meaning. Why be honest or dishonest? Why live or die? Motivations and reasons point us clearly to religion, not necessarily theistic or biblical faith, but religion in Paul Tillich's sense as ultimate concern. Our ultimate concern will govern our lives. Our ultimate concern will lead to a variety of unconcerns as well as passionate causes. Thus, in one European country, what used to be taught as history is now taught without dates. The flow of history towards the liberation of man by the modern state has taken its place. A radically humanistic sociology has replaced history. Not surprisingly, many students in many countries cannot locate their nation on the map nor answer questions correctly about the great persons and events of the 20th century. This is a religiously governed ignorance because its basic rationale comes out of modern humanistic faith. For biblical faith, history began with creation and the Garden of Eden. Man by his sin fell and the world now sees the workings of sin and death. Jesus Christ gives focus and direction to history towards making all things new. History is the account of man's struggle to play God and God's providential workings with men as he redeems and redirects them towards the new creation. The Bible gives us God's revelation to man in history and through history. It is an historical account. Humanism's new creation is only in the future and it is completely a human accomplishment. It's accomplished without gods by either autonomous man, the libertarian, or by the autonomous state, the totalitarian. In this accomplishment, the tool is not the knowledge of God's revelation and of providential history to see the application of God's law, word and judgment, but scientific planning and control. As a result, quote, social studies, end quote, sociology and science replace history in the curriculum and history becomes more and more irrelevant. All history teaching in humanistic schools is suffering as a result. Interest is often deflected to side issues which are given separate faculties, for example, black studies programs, feminist studies, etc. Medieval history has certainly suffered. On November the 5th, 1969, Joseph R. Strayer spoke on The Future of Medieval History to the Midwest Medieval Conference at the University of Illinois, Champaign. He said, The generation of Charles Homer Haskins simply took it for granted that any civilised man would study medieval history. They could not conceive of a college or even a high school curriculum in which medieval history did not occupy a prominent place. My generation realised that a little persuasion was necessary and that a little time had to be surrendered to other periods of history, but we were sure that we could convince our colleagues and our students that medieval history deserved to have a key position in a liberal arts programme. The new generation of medievalists will have to fight to keep it from being shoved into the back corner along with Sanskrit, Assyriology, and other subjects that are kept alive only through the efforts of a handful of specialists. During the student rebellions of the 1960s on one university campus, I had a number of students around me when the meeting ended, asking questions or issuing challenges. One whose question revealed a radical ignorance of the past and of history in general responded to my suggestion that he study a specific area of history germane to his query 
with an angry statement that he and his fellows were not interested in knowing the past, but determining the future. For him, neither religion nor history were essential to that task. His was a logical humanism, and other students said that the Bible was as important to remaking man and society as a comic book. History is, like all subjects, a theological study, and in a particularly pertinent fashion. Man lives his life in time and history. To be indifferent to the past and the future is to be ignorant and incompetent in facing the present. If the religion of a people be libertarian or anarchistic or statist and totalitarian, sociology and science will replace Christianity and history as man's means of understanding himself and his problems. Then, as Strayer feared, medievalists will end as antiquarians. The anti-historians refuse to regard religion and history and they accordingly see the horrors of their regimes as steps toward world liberation. Strayer noted, When I first read about the Albigensian Crusades some fifty years ago, I would have said that this was one type of evil that could not occur in the twentieth century. Now I wonder if we should not be re-examining the causes of the fall of Rome. To abandon history means to abandon also God and law. A common dismissal by students of any biblical and historical statement is, it doesn't have to be that way. The past has no meaning because there is for them no God to give determination and unchanging law, and certainly to history. For them, as for Dostoevsky's Rashkolnikov and others, because there is no God, all things are possible. In the 1920s, a senseless and vicious murder committed by two young men, Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, was a forerunner of legions of crimes committed since by young and old and by nations for, quote, reasons, end quote, of state. Leopold and Loeb felt no remorse and they saw no reason for not killing. The alternative to their action was faith in the biblical God. As Brophy noted, well, the alternative to their way was this. What it did offer them was God and they saw through him. He gave up the idea that there was a God, states one of the medical reports in Leopold, saying that if a God exists, some pre-God must have created him. In this line of thinking, he reasons by analogy. Having been taught that the moral law drew its sanction from God, the young men were simply being logical in concluding that to jettison God was to jettison the moral law as well. Indeed, this, in society's eyes, was their crime, or at least the crime of Leopold, the more intelligent of the two, he reasoned. And having worked out his position by reason, he could not be induced to change it under emotional pressure from the threat of death. As the medical report records, he stated that consistency has always been a sort of god to him. Contemporary statist education being anti-Christian is producing Leopold and Loeb's wholesale and it seeks a solution to its problem in even more anti-Christianity. When students are taught that there is no God and that values are simply personal choices, why should history govern or command them? Why should any kind of education command them? The growing illiteracy is due both to bad teaching methods and to bad content. With A. Crowley, its basic implication is do what thou wilt is the only law. Ironically, Brophy, who saw the problem clearly, believed that the answer called for constructing a new rationalism and laying the foundations of a 20th century morality. She saw the two great mainstays of this new morality as Bernard Shaw, metabiologist, and Sigmund Freud, hyperbiologist. Man, however, is God's creation and he functions best in terms of God's law. When faith in the triune God of Scripture is removed, 
Then, in time, the only valid way of governing man is by total controls and total terror. Plato, in his Laws, called for guardians to control man totally, to train the minds of the people not ever to consider acting as individuals. Even in dancing or singing a single step or note, contrary to the public and sacred songs and dances, should be punished. There could be no private religion. Anyone having a private shrine, even to the state gods, was to be punished. In such an order, there is no history, only an anthill society. Indeed, the goal of humanistic statism is the end of history. It is a permanently static anthill order. In the process, man must be dehumanised. History has no place in such an unchanging order. If private man seeks to have history, he is suppressed by total terrorism. There is another aspect to the anti-history perspective of modern and postmodern man. Albert William Levy said of Jean-Paul Sartre's existentialism, The heart of Sartre's strategy for freedom is an attempt to destroy the decisiveness of the past. St. Paul tells us plainly, The wages of sin is death, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. He states thereby a religious and an historical fact. Modern man is like Clarence Darrow, who, in his defence of Leopold and Loeb, rejected religious, anti-God motivation and the historical facts in favour of a psychological and sociological interpretation. He denied very much with pseudoscience the personal responsibility of the two young men. Darrow became a hero to the Liberals. In the process, he also was instrumental in an anti-history and an anti-Christian cause and favourable to modern statism.